Hello and welcome again. This is another edition of the Fitness Reborn podcast. My name is Sean from Renaissance Fitness Personal Training and I have a guest with me again today. Today I am joined by Lynn Bowman. She is a self-identified snarky grandma and she has got all kinds of good information that she's going to share with me and with you and we're just going to kick right into it here. Lynn, thanks for joining me. I am so happy to be here in Ames, Iowa, virtually. Um, <laughs> well, I'm happy to be with you in uh, Pasadena, California. Oh, Pasadena. no, no. I left Pasadena, honey, a long time okay. ago. And I am okay. now in, in um, between the redwoods and the ocean, about 35 miles south of San Francisco on the coast. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, I've is. been to California. I've been to California a couple of times. I've been to San Francisco. Uh, did you I went hug to Los... a tree? Did you hug a tree? I didn't hug them, but I did see a lot of them. And I stood right next to them. And I was just actually spellbound about how enormous these things are. They're, they're really yeah. magic. Truly magic. They, really, yeah. they really are. I mean, they, they're just, I think they're the biggest trees I've ever seen to date. Well, they are. <laughs> Um, but it, beyond that, they, they just have such a story behind them underneath the earth and in the upper story. And they're so old. And the, the history of their uh, communications with humans is kind of interesting. So it's, it's, I encourage everyone to come to California and see these trees. They are. Communications with, communications with humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How, how so? Well, nonverbal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I didn't think that's where you were going, but I thought you were make, make something of a bit more, uh, you know, ethereal than well, that. That's a whole other show. <laughs> all right? right. But but just take my word for it. They they're worth spending time with and walking beneath and sitting underneath and hugging <laughs> if you get a chance. <laughs> Okay. Well, maybe if I find my maybe if I find myself back out there, whenever back in Northern California, maybe I'll do just that. I'll find myself a redwood tree and give it a big there hug. You there you go. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, Lynn. All right. So, yeah. I I took it by reading your profile um, that your forte is nutrition. Is that is that kind of like the the strongest? Well, strongest, let's um, say my forte muscle? is being really old. I'm 76 okay. and okay. I'm out here talking about what it's like to be really old. And I am a, I like to say former diabetic. The truth of it is okay. that you are, are never not a diabetic really, if right. you have been one, but my numbers are now totally normal. So I love getting out and talking to people about how powerful it is to do sort of your side of it, the movement and um, mm -hmm. physical strength part of it and the nutrition part of it together. And I don't even think of it as nutrition. I think of it as eating well, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> eating really right. good food uh, is going to take you a long way. Uh, besides having fun with some friends, dancing, moving, walking in the gym, whatever. Those are the things that, that keep us happy and well into later life. And um, so my forte, mm, what is my forte? Being a grandma is my forte, I think. Um, okay. But, but staying on my feet, you know, <laughs> I, want, mm -hmm. I want all of us to have what we need to, to stay involved and active in life as long as we can. And the research, okay. the research is all out there telling us how much of what is wrong with us or painful, especially in later life, is self-inflicted. You know, it's preventable, avoidable. Mm -hmm. Not all of it. Exactly. But a huge, huge amount of it. And now, of course, we're all talking about inflation and how expensive everything is and so on and so forth. And people, mm -hmm. I think, don't stop to think that their poor health is costing them everything literally everything so it's costing them financially and emotionally and everything and so i love teaming up with folks on your end of the, you know your age to start mm -hmm. talking about this process of staying healthy don't wait until you're in your 70s you know or or 60s or 50s it's no. a lifelong 
process. Mm -hmm. But if you're just really kind of getting it and you're in your 50s or 60s or 70s, yay, good. It's it's not too late to, to make a super, you know, big positive difference in your life. And yes, right. eating, eating is a big part of that. Because yeah. eating badly got you here, probably, if you're having difficulty. <laughs> exactly right. You know, that's more or less what I tell the people um, that I'm working with. Because a lot of times when I'm working with someone who is in their 50s and 60s, they are now just waking up to this reality. You know, it's usually like, you know, you know, usually someone who is just now gone into their 50s or maybe they're close to it. And it's like, you know what? Stuff is hurting more than it used to. You know, I'm, I, I'm, you know, and now we're coming out of COVID. It's like, it's hurting more. I put on all this weight. I can't get rid of it. I don't get what's going on here. You know, and, and they come to you, you generally as a trainer is like, help me figure this out because I tried and I, it's just not going well. I get it. And you know, I, is that the experience I, you generally have? No, <laughs> because, um, <laughs> it personally speaking, I found out in my 40s that I was diabetic. I had gestational diabetes. So part of what's put me where okay. I am now is knowing earlier than a lot of people do the effects of what you eat and how important it is right. to learn about it and do the right thing. And I discovered that the medical community is not helpful. Uh, I had to go okay. look for these answers on my own. And there was no internet then <laughs> because it was mm -hmm. before the dollar. Time, right but but right. I read and interviewed and talked and I and I kind of you know worked my way through it under and back in the day what they would say to diabetics is eat all day you know eat small meals regular meals don't eat a lot of sugar try and control your carbs and lose weight what they didn't tell you was that when you are when your insulin system doesn't operate correctly, which is essentially what diabetes is. Losing weight is problematic because insulin is all about fat storage. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have this wonky system working against you when it comes to losing weight. So it took me a lot of years, a lot of research. And uh, when I finally really, and in fact, Sean, the, the, some of the most important information I got, I got in 2019. So recently I had my book brownies for breakfast about mm -hmm. half three quarters done. And I went to this conference with the plantricians who are MDs from all over the world who are kind of outliers because they feel like food is medicine and that their medical practice should be based on natural healing food. Mm -hmm. And so, I went to this conference to hear them and it was people that you would know, probably T Colin Campbell and, um, Dean Ornish, people who are kind of legends in the, the field of natural health. Okay. And so I went and I listened to them and there were these, I mean, it was just from morning until night, it was PowerPoint after PowerPoint data. This was the first time I had seen a lot of the hard data on nutrition vis-a-vis -vis, um, diabetes, particularly, and heart health. And it was really plain to see uh, that it needed to be, and I'm not the first one out here saying this, you've heard it mm -hmm. be before, plant-based, huge, and uh, whole food, we know this, but... Right. I came out of that conference a vegan. I wanted to, I, I went in, you know, meat eater because that was the way I had been taught right. to deal with myself as a diabetic. And so for mm -hmm. the six months following that conference, I was absolutely strictly experimenting as a vegan. I didn't have one bite of any kind of animal, anything for six months. And went okay. back. I had my blood test done. I went back in, got retested. Guess what? I had dropped several points in my hemoglobin A1C, which, and depending on where you are listening to this, you may not know that the older you get, and they've always said it's a progressive disease. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bowman. It's a progressive disease. You know, it's just, <laughs> so, um, 
here I had, had proven data point of one that it wasn't a progressive disease. I was reversing it. And then sure mm-hmm. enough, you know, as I went further, I further reduced it. I am no longer strictly, strictly vegan. I've experimented and done more research about it. And I now eat some fish and every six months I'll have or so I'll have a piece of grass fed, you know, totally from one of my neighbors because I live in a rural place and, and a lot of right. grass fed cattle raised and finished here. Um, but, and I eat eggs because I am convinced that eggs from a good, happy chicken that, you know, mm-hmm. it's great food. It's really just fine food. And the hen is fine with you taking her egg. She's like, yeah, thanks. Go on now. Um, so, but what's happened is now my hemoglobin A1C, which is of course the indicator of where you are on average with your blood sugar is now normal. I'm testing out of diabetic range. And that was unheard of a while back because the way they treated diabetes was with meds and with right. bad diet information. Um, so I am here to tell everyone who's listening, I'm living proof and my book reflects all of that. But the big news really is it's not just for diabetics. It's the same exact prescription for everyone. If you don't want to have that heart disease you're concerned about and you you know, if you really just want to have your weight normalized, this whole list of things that are basically food related problems. And I don't mean to leave out the movement part of it, Sean, because it's it's all one system. Right. Your your food intake and your exercise outtake is all absolutely related. Right. But it doesn't have to be pumping iron in the gym, you know, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure you agree with me. Just move and keep right. moving. Right. Oh, the, on the end of things, the physical movement of things, like I kind of take a different approach here. So I work with primarily correcting ec- corrective exercises. So uh-huh. working with working with people that, you know, they like being active. They like lifting weights and running and doing all that stuff that, you know, a, a normal, happy, healthy person does enjoy doing. Um, so when I'm, te- when I'm getting them to do this, I'm taking them through a process where I can correct like imbalances and alleviate uh-huh. pain, you know, that they can get out there and they can actually enjoy their lives more so. So they can actually go out and run with their children and their grandchildren, or they can mm-hmm. come into the gym and lift and lift weights and, and not risk injuring themselves. Cause a lot of people hurt themselves cause they don't have a good foundation. They don't have good form all that kind of stuff here too. So yeah, I'm not necessarily in per se the fat loss, you know, industry because I don't really emphasize that, although that is a part of it. It goes with the territory. If you're right. moving and it needs to move more and you can be freed up to move, the, the weight will normalize itself. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I hope you'll notice that I'm in my workout clothes and I'm on my way to my little gym when we're done talking. <laughs> Good deal. Um, good deal. Well, and I, and to me, it's all about you, Sean. It's all about the trainer. It's all about having a teacher who mm-hmm. is thoughtful and supportive and, and of course trained and gets it and knows how not to injure people. And I work out with a little kind of neighborhood group and, and my trainer is Kristen is fabulous. And she, it, she has grown to, as you probably have really appreciate her older clients uh, mm-hmm. because we so appreciate her. We so appreciate having a supportive, loving, sensible place to go and work out at the pace that we can right. and at the, at the uh, kind of level that we're comfortable with. And we do Pilates, we do TRX. Um, she mixes it up and mat That's work good. and weight, all of it. Uh, I'm, pumping it up all the time and throwing down <laughs> planks with the best of them. But it's, it's also such a great social life for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially two and a half years into COVID here. Right. And this was a safe, comfortable, totally cleaned. And I know you do this with your equipment and everything. Right. Um, it, it's, it was a safe place for us to go and get some, some good sweating done. Um, two or three times a week or four times if you're really hardcore. 
and it was just two miles down the road. So very lucky there. But I, I would encourage anybody uh, of a certain age to not be afraid of just get back in there and go. Um, right. And I, I know you've you've talked about falling. I've I've heard mm-hmm. you um, go into that. Right. And one of the most important things I think for seniors to do in the gym is balance work. Exactly. It's huge. Uh, and you don't think about that until you have a, a really um, wonderful trainer, but it just doing, and it's not really, it's hard. It's not hard. It's mm-hmm. kind of fun and kind of easy, but just getting those muscles lit up again so mm-hmm. that your knees are working and your arms are working and your balance is right. better. Right, right, and exactly. Makes us just more aware of right. ourselves moving through space, thinking about it. Um, right, exactly. I, um, you know, um, I haven't been so writing the recently, work, but you know, until for seniors, recently. The balance work for mm-hmm. seniors is, for everyone. Is, is, extremely, is extremely important. And what I've encountered um, when I work with older people is that, you know, the balance work, because by design, in order to strengthen your balance, you have to almost go into positions or that are kind of precarious and, you know, that kind of risk you losing your balance. And a lot of times, you know, people are actually, I would say most of them, if not all, are afraid of getting hurt more. And so there is sometimes a resistance towards doing balance work because, you know, they think it's just, it's just far too dangerous. Well, Would you agree uh, with that? Like, that's just. It, no, doing balance work isn't dangerous as far as I'm concerned. I mean, obviously when we do that work in the gym, right. typically there's padding, you have someone mm. supportive who's there. But I would much rather fall in a gym with my trainer than go head first down some stairs. Um, you know, I, I also, I think just having the fear somewhat removed, feeling more confident in your body mm-hmm. is huge. For, and right. if, if it's been a long time since you danced or did you know any kind of heavy play physically you just you lose confidence in your body and mm-hmm. working with a trainer in the gym can help get you back there i think um right well well, well, I'm, well I'm i totally agree like i think it's completely necessary and vital to their life that they learn how to actually be steady on their own feet well I'm, what i'm saying is that you know, I've encountered a lot of either outright resistance or just kind of like, mm, okay, I'm not sure about this because it just looks, they've been told that they need to avoid getting hurt. And a lot of times avoiding right. being hurt means that heart means that you barely just don't do anything, that like you don't risk anything, you know? And right. so, I mean, their, their fear is valid. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, being too scared will keep you from actually improving yourself. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. life just as much fun if if you don't <laughs> go out boldly sometimes right um we, we need to to keep our uh confidence as much as we can I, you know i think and a- another thing that people are talking about now going back a little bit on the nutrition part mm-hmm. of it because the fear subject makes me think that I was terrified of not eating, of not having food with me. And um, now all of the evidence has come back. The science is very clear that for diabetics and a lot of other issues, really all humans, we're not designed to eat three meals or four meals or snacks all day. That's not how our bodies are made. Mm -hmm. We are actually designed, hardwired to go without food and it, it turns out it's very healthy for us to go without food right. for, you know, right. not, not super long periods of time, but, uh, I'm someone who's now learned to eat a couple of meals a day, maybe. And meals is, you know, a broad like term. Meal. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. And sometimes it'll be one fairly substantial one and two little ones. Um, and sometimes it's just one and 
what you find is, and I always, by the way, have food with me wherever I go. I always have some little emergency stash just so I feel like, okay, if I need it, I've got it. Like also right. carrying water with me as I go. But uh, this process of autophagy that people are talking about now, right. which I knew nothing about a number of years ago, right. fascinating the way your body can't, <clears throat> it can't clean itself internally unless you stop shoving food in. Right. So, and, and, and the relationship between going without food and sleep, your sleep, and a lot of seniors complain about sleep issues. You probably hear this from people. And those sleep issues can be related to eating too late um, and not leaving enough time for your belly to empty before you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So I, I would encourage anyone who hasn't tried it to experiment with eating a little earlier in the day and leaving more time between your last meal and when you sleep. And if you're in the habit of pizza in front of Jimmy Kimmel or somebody at night, no, <laughs> um, just no. So do you, do you, do you don't fast do regularly? Well, I don't even use the word fast. It's, you know, I go... 12, 16, 18 hours without food. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And when you think about it, it's, it's quite natural. I eat my last food very often at two, three in the afternoon done. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm a lark, so I'm active in the morning and I'm awake early, early in the morning and, and then late afternoon I'm done. And plus, Ladies, I don't want to clean the kitchen anymore. It's such a joy <laughs> to just have all that wrapped up, right? right. No dishes on the sink, nothing. It's clean. Um, but I, I eat my last food typically in the afternoon, sometimes pretty early in the afternoon. And then I don't eat again until 9, 10, maybe later in the morning. So if you count it up, those are that's plenty of time for this autophagy to kick in. It needs 16 to 18 hours to work. Right. Right. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, I, I played around with autophagy cause I, I heard about it, you know, quite a few years ago and I started reading about it and I, I did it a few times. I played around with the, you know, the eight and 16, um, eating, uh, schedule. I even did a stretch, a really long stretch of three days without eating. Um, that was, you know, it, it was rough at times, but it got easier as it went on. And it, uh -huh. <laughs> it got easier as it got on. And actually when my time was up, um, I, I was told, I read, I had to be careful about eating again, about what I ate going right back into it. Cause I would have a, a terrible abdominal pain if I just splurged on the first thing that I saw. <laughs> so, no big Mac. Okay. Right. No. <laughs> right. No. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I took an interest in this a couple of years ago and I have heard that people who do the intermittent fasting thing, the autophagy, however you want to look at it, they have, I've met a number of people who swear by it say, Oh my God, I've, I feel yeah. so much better. I've dropped this weight that I couldn't get rid of. I have all this energy, you know, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, I, it's something that, you know, it's not new. Fasting is not new. It's been around since the dawn oh, no, of time. No, no, it's Right. But no. to me, the revelation was that if you're diabetic, we are always told in the past, mm -hmm. don't get too hungry. Don't go without food, you know, eat frequent meals and so on. Wrong. Right. Um, the evidence has all come back saying, oh, no, diabetics especially benefit from going a, a, a little more time between meals. And, uh, you know, when you say the word fasting, you immediately get this picture of somebody in a little loincloth and, you know, very skinny and uh, right. it's, it just, it just, it's a bit of freedom when you think about it to not feel like you have to be shoveling food in all the time. And, and you, depending, we're all different mm -hmm. this way, but a lot of people get enormous energy from this. Right. Um, and, and in my case, I didn't, I wasn't particularly overweight. But yeah, the, I lost weight. I lost 15, 20 pounds over a period of a couple of years without trying at all, mm -hmm. uh, just changing the timing of my food. Really. Right. I think, I think and, as you get older, uh, it's actually, it becomes more paramount because one, as you get older, your insulin resistance decreases. So that's where, you know, all this extra pounds come from. 
and um, your, your metabolism slows anyway. It can't process food just as well as it used to. So it's kind of even more. Yes. But a lot of what you're saying yeah. and gets said about older life is based on not healthy older life. Mm -hmm. It's based on data that includes so many people who have become less healthy in older life because of lifestyle issues. Mm -hmm. So if you are maintaining your weight and if you are maintaining your muscle tone to a great degree, also very interesting stuff is coming out now about hormones, Sean, that, you know, women were sort of shut out of the whole hormone argument because most of the people doing the research and dispensing the meds were guys. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my theory anyway. Um, it's probably and there true. Are plenty of people who would support that. Uh, probably true. Um, but what we're finding is that if hormones, I'm talking about estradiol and progesterone, are applied in the right amount, not internally, not taken by mouth, but applied uh, topically, that women can build bone back mm -hmm. and women can, can return to muscle mm -hmm. health to a great extent, much more like their younger life. So, and this is fairly new because hormones for women got a terrible name, some bad research, some bad PR saying that you were going to get cancer, you know, if you, if you took hormones, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a whole country full of angry women in menopause now <laughs> who, who are going, wait a minute, <laughs> wait, uh, what's wrong with this picture? But it's a very hopeful picture um, that, that the news on hormone replacement uh, can make a huge difference in how we go on into later life. Right. Uh, and of course, so many more of us are being athletic mm -hmm. longer and running marathons and so on. Right, right. Uh, I'm a horsewoman, and there are plenty of women like me, old babes out there riding around. And we're the ones saying, wait a minute, so if I break a bone, I'm done, um, right? That This is sort of the, the mythology in a way that, that you can't be active because there's this risk of breaking a bone, and that'll be the end of times for you. Mm -hmm. um, there is a grain of truth to that, but what Sean is doing, um, if you if you keep your muscle tone up pretty well and keep moving and eat well, and, you, and how much you weigh has a lot to do with it. If if you are putting strain on your body with extra weight, mm -hmm. you're in a different situation. If you break a bone or have a sprain or something. Right. So uh, to me, everything just points right back to eat well and move your buns. Right, right. And then and sleep. sleep. And I didn't know until f fairly recently, in the last few years, no one had ever pointed out to me explicitly that we only heal in deepest sleep. That in order to get your natural healing system going, you have to be in that deep deep state of sleep, which a lot of people never get to, mm -hmm. you know, because, it, because sleep is relegated in our culture. Sleep is a thing that wimps do, right? You do when you're, you, when you just can't stand up right. anymore, then you go right. to sleep. Right, right. Doctors, yeah. think about it. Medical school, they're trained not to sleep. <laughs> Do you really want somebody working on you that has not slept? No, I no, don't. I, I really don't. And, you know, if, speaking as someone who does work in a hospital, I mean, the I know the one I work at, especially the surgical teams, they make a priority to make sure that these guys are – these guys and girls are rested, very well rested. I mean, they sometimes – you know, you, you're on call and you get called into th a, a, you know, emergency surgery at three o'clock in the morning or something like that. That's that that happens, but they they make it so that it's it doesn't like put the pa patient's life in danger, you know, by having you come in sleep Thank deprived. You. Yeah. Right. So I mean, that's the reality of being right. a surgeon in a hospital, unfortunately. But yeah, I do know like. 
um, uh, emergency room doctors and things like that, a lot of the times these folks, if they work long stretches, they can be pretty sleep deprived. And, you know, I, I don't think anyone's life is really ever in danger. They still do right by their docs. And I think we do very well by our patients, but still, I mean, and it, and it, run, it ruins your circadian rhythm. You know, it makes it hard right. to really get settled when you're trying to get settled. I mean, I know the stuff myself too, but I will say though, that for the, the fitness industry, I've noticed a trend myself that, you know, people such as yourself and experts and are coming forward and saying, you know what, this stuff is actually hurting us. We need to actually go in the other direction. Sleep is a priority. Okay, this 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 macho yeah. culture of like sleep is for the weak is just killing us. That's not helpful. You know, literally, right? literally killing us. Yeah. Um, you know, eating yeah. eating constantly all the time because you hear this a lot of times, especially you know as a guy in a gym. You spend a lot of time there on guys. You know, you hear about them eat eat eat. You know, so you know you can put on the the mass and all that stuff. Eat eat eat. You know, I do eat. I do like food. I'm just not a huge eater, you know? So that was never something I really could kind of get behind. It's like, it just didn't work for me. Um, but then, you know, and now, and again with hormone. Well, and Sean, food, food isn't just food. I mean, mm -hmm. the range of benefit that you're getting from your food is, is a direct correlation with the quality of the food that you're eating. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah. And by the way, I feel that I have to mention that, uh, and I don't have the statistics in front of me right now, but one of the big causes of death in the country, like right up there in the top 10 is medical mistakes. So somebody is making them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people who are making those mistakes are MDs. And some of them probably because they hadn't slept, but that's right. a guess. But the, but the, the number, the, the damage that the healthcare system does we we know you know this mm -hmm. it can be enormous right yeah right. you know as long as in addition to the healing that's done in addition to the, the fixing that they've done um we we need to do better with our health care for sure right right so um i do and i know i've heard this too that you know as far as like the medical profession and nutrition like nutrition is really not something i think is really emphasized in medical school like it maybe gets maybe a semester or two it gets nothing no it gets like a few hours right that's it and if you, if you question any of this all you have to do for your own research is go to a hospital cafeteria and look at what they're serving for food and that should answer all your questions about it um and there are exceptions to this very few but but it seems like hospitals hospitals particularly for-profit hospitals are the last ones to get the memo about how important good food is mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't it doesn't fit into the priorities right, at all right. okay so lynn i'm gonna i'm and, go, ahead, and, go ahead finish your thought no that's okay you're no. the boss right now no you're your the show. boss you're the guest <laughs> Um, so I was just going to jump back a little bit here and just kind of take, uh, and just kind of go from the beginning. Like, so you got your, your quest here. What was the jumping off point? What really lit that spark to say, you know, this needs to be put into a book and it needs to be, you know, put in front of the masses. So what, what got that going? A couple of things. This is not my first book. So, so this okay. is a thing that I, I do. Um, but this particular book I did because my children all, as I told you earlier, are in their later forties, mm -hmm. told me I had to do it. They said, you just have to put this out there. You have to write it down. And, um, I, earlier in my life, a seminal event was that my mother died when I was 18 okay. and she died of a chronic disease, which she couldn't have helped. It was kidney disease, but I had this very close up and personal look at what chronic disease does to a family. And it, it, I mean, I lost my mother. I actually lost my whole family, my house, my dog, everything was gone because all the money was gone because of my mother's chronic disease. And so I've always been tuned into that in a way. And, and I, understand how something like 85% of the, 
of the bankruptcies in this country are because yeah, of ill health. Medical, and medical expenses, uh, typically... yeah. Yes, right. And, and most of it is chronic mm -hmm. ill health, chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes. Everyone's always talking about the price of insulin. Well, you know, there are type 1 diabetics for whom that is not uh, debatable. But if you're a type 2 diabetic, chances are excellent that you don't need to be medicated if you will do what I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> if you will do what we now know, it, it will reverse and control and manage your disease. Mm -hmm. And it's the same prescription for heart disease. It's the same prescription for anything going with uh, overweight. It's, the, it's just, it's, and it's so simple when you think about it. There's nothing, it's, it's something you can memorize. It's easy. The big thing that's a big adjustment for most people, and I'm so accustomed to people when you say, well, you have to give up sugar. And of course people go, no, sorry. You know, there's no way to give uh -huh. up sugar. Um, and I say, well, if you were addicted to heroin, um, would you be willing to cut back? Well, no, you just have to quit. Well, sugar is more addictive than heroin. All the science is there. I'm not making this up. It's a highly addictive substance. Uh -huh. And if you're eating sugar, you're addicted to it. And if you're eating sugar, you should understand what that sugar is doing to your body. And once you see, it's like mm -hmm. smoking, you know, once you understand what the downside is, you keep doing it at your own risk. I mean, you've now been told what the damage is. And, but here's the good news. Um, it's now possible to eat brownies for breakfast uh, donuts, cake, everything, you just use a different chemical besides the cane, the processed cane sugar that you've been using. You use a more natural uh, sugar. And I outline in my book what those are. There's more coming out all the time because there's a real market now for people like me who understand that sugar's the enemy. Sugar's not my friend. Uh, and Sugar, I mean, the people who are making those sugary foods are not my friend. They're, they're all about their shareholder value. Mm -hmm. They're not about your health. Right. So you're, you're putting money in someone's pocket for making you ill, which I never understood that. Um, well, uh, so you can do this. You need to quit sugar. You need to eat whole food and you need to eat plant-based food. Um, and it's, you know, it's not much harder than that, but the downside is somebody has to cook something. Mm -hmm. You can't drive through and get this. You can't go into Starbucks and get this. I'm sorry. Um, and people are going into Starbucks for coffee, right? And they're coming out with 24 ounces of basically yeah, it's sugar. Ba it's basically, yeah, I, I see that a lot. It's basically and, a birthday cake in a cup. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And there, but, and also dentists are screaming, Sean, because people are holding this against their gums all day. And so affluent young people are coming in, having rotted out their front teeth with their frappuccinis. Mm -hmm. Does this make any sense at no. all? Well, I mean, it doesn't, but then a lot, like any other addiction, it doesn't make any sense. It's just kind of something that just compulsively. Now, just, just to clarify, when you mean by sugars, you mean like um, manufactured sugars. You're not talking about the sugars in an apple or anything Thank like you. that. No, 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 no. Yeah, manufactured gotcha. sugar. Thank you. Except processed right. sugar. And um, I eat fruit all the time. Okay. I eat two, three fruits a day, at least right now, because stone fruit's in season. I, I want to <laughs> eat it all the time, but I don't. Uh, but, it, but there is a great deal of wisdom, Ayurvedic and other wisdom, some evidence-based uh, Western medicine wisdom that you eat fruit in season. Okay. And that that, that is helpful to your microbiome. That, that as humans, we are hardwired to be in tune with, is it summer? Okay, it's berry time. It's stone fruit season. Is it fall? 
okay, pears and apples and so on. And so um, we just keep, we should be observing the ancient ritual of eating fruit when nature offers us that fruit. Mm. Um, and we're so used to eating grapes from Chile and bananas from, you know, wherever, all these things that have been shipped a billion miles to us, which it's, it's a nice convenience, but it's not the healthiest thing. Right. And you can say, well, fine for you, because yes, we do on my place. We, we have apple trees and pear trees and we have berries and all those things. Um, but you've got farmer's markets wherever you are likely mm -hmm. and, yeah, and you've got do. um produce markets where and one of the best things you can have in your life is a produce market where you can go in and say listen sam what's good right now and and you're talking to someone who actually understands the food that they're selling mm -hmm. you i love that right um, well, one, I think one of the biggest barriers to people eating more organically, I think they would, but sometimes it's cost prohibitive to do so. I mean, fresher, no, it's not? No, 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 sorry, I interrupted you rudely because this is so important. People seem to think that healthy food is more expensive. And in fact, what it will cost you is a little okay. more time because you do have to cook you do have to chop something. But if you think about how much, and um, actually m my husband snuck a Big Mac the other day, just <laughs> just kind of to see what it still tasted like uh -huh. and so on. And I found the receipt uh, from his, and he got a Diet Coke and a Big Mac. And it was, I don't know, eight or $9. Uh -huh. You know, a lot, I mean, by my standard, that for, for a crummy hamburger and a bad drink, um, you can fix a meal for a, a healthy meal for a bunch of people for that kind of money. And I, I actually, not too long ago, and I, I wrote this up in my newsletter, we hadn't been having people over because of COVID mm -hmm. and all the thing. Everybody else has been trapped in their homes. You know what I'm talking about. And so we, we kind of opened the door and we had just a very few, we had six people around the table, which was great. It was a treat. And I made um, what I call beefless stroganoff with one of the newer meat substitutes, which I do occasionally eat. And I think they're, they're okay food, you know, if, if it kind of takes care of that yen that you have. I made beefless stroganoff, which has a lot of mushrooms and onions in it. It's a great sauce kind of a fifties um, thing that we used to do over noodles. And we had a wonderful salad and a, a nice little bottle of Pinot Noir. I mean, you know, modest, but good mm -hmm. Pinot Noir. And the whole dinner for six people, including the wine was 30 bucks. Nice. Now, where can you go? What restaurant can you go into? Whether it's a taqueria or a, you know, some kind of fast food. And, and feed six people around a table very generously for 30 right. bucks. But you have to prepare it yourself. You, you have to think about it and know what it is. And you have to have some stuff in your larder. And so my cookbook is a, it's kind of like a, a guidebook from start to finish, including what to buy, what to store, um, you know, how to, how to sit down to the right. table, right? Yes, please. Item number one, sit down. <laughs> Literally, it's, it's in my list of how to do this. Sit down. Don't stand at the kitchen sink and narf down. <laughs> That's not eating. No. no. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm guilty so, of it myself. Uh, no, it's not <laughs> worth it. <laughs> I know you are, and I know you're eating pizza no, at I'm, 11 No, I'm not doing that. Sometimes. So I'm, I, I have that much sense. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I think we kind of lost a little sound here. I'm not picking you up anymore, Lynn. 
Right. Oh, I Can hear you, you hear now? me now? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's dipping out the internet. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't, right. I didn't hear I'm you now. I didn't hear you anything you said. Huh? I didn't say anything because because I wasn't getting you. But oh. you can edit, right? Oh uh, yeah, I can edit. Okay, okay. all right. All right. So I, I hear you now. Uh, it was a. Uh, um, I don't eat pizza at eleven at night. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. I believe you. <laughs> right. Um, so you are the one guy in the United States who doesn't occasionally sneak some pizza in front of the TV. I don't. I don't really that. even watch television. Actually, I mean, usually if I'm eating standing up, it's because I'm. I have to go. Like I'm always moving. You're huh? you're not right. Well, and a lot of us are, are not watching TV anymore, right? and um, y y the younger ones are seeing whatever they want to see on their screens, right? right. Their exactly. iPads or whatever. All that is changing, but um, yeah, food, good, healthy food is not expensive. Plus you're cutting way down on the trash, you know, less plastic, less paper. Um, and let's not even count how much it costs you to go out and buy Prilosec and stuff to take care of the indigestion that you get by eating your crappy cheap food. Mm -hmm. um, Cheap, cheap food isn't really cheap if you really consider the total cost right. of that food. And uh, don't even get me started about factory farming and where cheap food comes from. And if you're eating, especially if you're eating meat, any kind of meat, people think, oh, well, chicken, chicken is healthy. What? No, it's not. Chicken is the most tainted meat you can eat in the United States. Uh, the way, I, I mean, unless you're buying chicken from a local farmer and you know that farmer and you mm -hmm. know the chicken's name that you're now ingesting, chicken is a mess. They pump it full of all salt and all this stuff. So um, if, you're, if you're concerned about reducing the cost of your food, and in a way, who is it now? Mm -hmm. Yes, food has gone up, it's more expensive. But if you're concerned about reducing the cost of your food, don't eat meat. Uh, right there, that's huge. Yeah. It's much less expensive to eat plant-based than to eat a meat-based right. diet. Yeah, I agree. And I'll even tell you, like, I am a vegan myself. So, um, so I got on that a couple of years ago, and you know, I was kind of. I was vegetarian at first, and then I decided to take it to the next level and go vegan. And it's worked out pretty well. Uh, yeah. There are issues, right. social issues. <laughs> People point and stare. <laughs> right? And they, they always just... Well, I mean, the, well, uh, well, the, you, the main question you... you get is the inevitable, the ever-present, how do you get your protein? Right. Right. That, how do you right. get your protein? How, what, what do you say? I get my, I get my protein from what the do you plants I eat, that? which have proteins built into them. I mean, you see all these enormous mammals that eat nothing but plants, and they're, and they're you know, absolutely right. powerful creatures. You know, they don't eat meat. Where do you think they get it from? Right. <laughs> it's just, it's, just it, right. it's, it's a natural but line of thought to me. I was like, you know, think of a mountain gorilla. A mountain gorilla, a silverback is stronger than 10 men combined. He doesn't eat meat. <laughs> so there you go. Right, right. Yeah, but, but we've been so conditioned and, and I'm, I'm sort of guilty by association here. I, my earlier career was all mm -hmm. in advertising and it's, it can all be blamed on advertising. You know, the milk does a body good and uh, the whole idea that it, without a steak, what are you, right? You can't be a man if you're not eating steak mm -hmm. all the time. These are all ideas that, that came through the advertising industry. And we're still guilty of buying that hook, line, and sinker. You know, Wheaties, the mm -hmm. breakfast of champions, and this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> no, no, just, just no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just yeah. No. 
It's the beauty of yeah, advertising. No. Uh, okay, so, yeah. so if people were to get your book, it. Brownies right. for Breakfast, where would they find it, Lynn? It's on Amazon, uh, and so just it's if you just put Brownies for Breakfast in on Amazon, right. it should pop right up. Uh, it is also if you would prefer to buy from your local bookseller, and I would encourage you to do that. I love local booksellers. Just ask for it and have them order it for you. They can order it through their their wholesaler, okay. Ingram Spark, and um, it's designed so that it's it works for eight year olds and eighty five year olds. It's very simple, um, very graphic. Uh, I just happen to have a copy <laughs> right here. Uh, it's um, big pictures, mm -hmm. big type, and. It's um, also, I want to brag a minute, I took the photographs myself okay. on my iPhone, most of them, not all, but many of them. Um, and the reason is because having worked in the advertising industry, I saw what they did with food when we would do a shoot to make it look good. You know, you'd paint it with stuff and dip it and stuff. And do, so I wanted to present food the way mm -hmm. you would make it. So that it looks like a real person made it in a real kitchen, right? You know, and it and right. um, it's realistic. So all the photographs are, even though I think some of them are very nice. Um, here's blistered padrone peppers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I, th I think we've all experienced that the, that shock of the yeah, when you see how food a certain food looks in a picture, and then you actually get to it and you're like. Wait a yeah. minute. <laughs> right. And here's one of my favorite meals, Sean. Popcorn and rosé Pop wine. When did you ever see well, that in a diet book? I mean, I don't look at a lot of diet books, but I'm assuming probably not many. <laughs> no. So, because to me, uh, oh, and look at this. I'm just opening any old page. Aren't these the most gorgeous things? Those are watermelon mm. radishes. Uh, which if you start really eating whole food, you end up going, wow, right? this is so beautiful. <laughs> Who knew that a radish could be not only so delicious, but so pretty to put on the table. Um, oh, here's a thing that I spend a lot of time on soup. This is red okay. pepper soup because Americans don't eat much soup and it's so easy to make. It's so satisfying to eat. You, it really fills your belly. And I don't know. And then you can use it for sauce. It takes just a few minutes to prep some stuff and throw some stuff in the pan and make it. But for some reason, uh, Americans just, I don't know why exactly. It's kind of a grandma thing maybe. But I, I think that soup is a great addition to your table. And again, going back to the, the money thing, Soup is the way you use up all the stuff in your fridge that you bought with good intentions, but it's kind of getting limp and it's been there mm -hmm. a few days. Make soup. Use it all up. If you are eating all the food you buy, you're saving money on food. If you're throwing right. food away, no matter what it is, you're, you're spending too much on your food. So soup is brilliant. Um, there's a soup in the book called Genius Soup that... Um, as you can tell by its name, is particularly <laughs> brilliant because you make a pot of it and then you can make all these different mm -hmm. meals with it just so easily. Um, and a thing, you probably know about this, Sean, but chickpea pasta. Have uh, chickpea pasta. No, I've not tried you? that. <laughs> well, you're going to now because, and you're going to make genius soup because what happens is you just take a quart of this soup out of the freezer because you put some genius soup in the freezer because you're smart that way and you pull it out, thaw it out, put it in a, a pan, heat it to boiling, maybe add a little more broth and you put the whole box of chickpea pasta, which is speaking mm -hmm. of protein, it's all protein. It's deep. So you put the whole box in there, you bring it back to a boil, put the lid on, let it sit there for 10 minutes. You walk away, you fold your laundry. Um, no, you well, don't I, I live by myself, so yes, I do. <laughs> okay, all right. So then you come back 
and it's all ready. And it's this wonderful, like a grandma had been in the kitchen the whole time, making you this noodly, vegetably wonderful. And you sprinkle a little nutritional yeast flakes on top, a little maybe some um, vegan mm -hmm. Parmesan on top of it. Such a great meal. And it costs you the the price of the the chickpea pasta and a few old vegetables right you know which not much so good and you can feed three or four people five people from that little pot that you just made out of that one box of chickpea pasta so do not tell me how expensive it is to eat healthy <laughs> i won't hear it well i was just parroting what people have told me so i just i actually wanted you to address that so <laughs> Good, because I did. <laughs> I hope I made right. my point. To no, everybody. no, I, I think you came through yeah. loud and clear on that. All right, good. All right, so Lynn, yeah. All if, right. Great. for anyone listening, if there was one big takeaway from this whole interview that you would want them to have stuck in their mind, what the one thing that they could learn from you more than anything, what do you think it would be? that things really can Thank get you. better with age. Uh, not, not just <laughs> cheese, you know. Um, so if, if I can be any example, I've never been happier. It, life can be really wonderful mm -hmm. if you're healthy. Um, it helps right. so much that's, that's to the be key. healthy. So I want to help you get there, and I know you right, want right. to help everybody get there. I think there. in some way, part of my own my own mission here is kind of – it's for my own sake as well. I'm helping people directly who need the help, yes. But I like to think, especially now that I'm getting closer to 40 years old here, that, that you know, <gasps> I'm not in decline. I'm actually thriving. I'm actually on – I'm on the cusp of things here. Because this is kind of something I was kind of told both directly and indirectly by people I've known. Because I hear, you know, grouching from people within my family. Oh, I'm so old. Everything hurts. You know, it's just, you know, you're lucky. You're young. You're on the cusp of things. I'm in, I'm on the other side of the hill. Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, this is kind of me raging against that, I suppose. <laughs> Good for you. And, and I will also tell you, as the mother of people in their 40s and also being a grandmother, you especially a little sexist here, but you men, you start getting so much better in your 40s. I agree with that. You know, I agree with that. And so I've actually seen smarter. that. I've actually seen that myself with guys that yeah. I've known for a while. I think that's probably pretty typical, actually. Yeah, right, you know, around 30s and 40s is when you know, a man tends to really come into his own. Because some of these guys that were just kind of burnouts when I knew them back 20 years ago and when we were just out of high school or in high school. And now they are just like, wow, what a turnaround. Like they really have a good life, you know? And you mellow, um, you understand mm -hmm. better. And let's face it, in your teens, 20s, early 30s, you're nothing but raging hormones. You're following your yeah. hormones wherever they take you to a great degree. Uh, and uh, we are having children later, speaking now more for women. Uh, so, so many women don't have their lives completely consumed by children and family in their 20s. Um, my youngest daughter, who uh, like you, medical career, mm -hmm. she's a, a nurse practitioner, had her first baby at 43, not too long ago. Um, and she's not, you know, alone there. So many women are postponing mm -hmm. childbirth now. So, no, you you guys just start getting really, really good in your 40s. And and then 50s, yeah, even better. And, uh, and it goes on. Uh, <laughs> my husband is um, well, better all the time. I'm sure, he, I'm sure he's happy to hear and, you say uh, that. I mean... Yeah. You know, the, the aging, the aging phobia applies to guys too. I mean, it's a, you know, you, it, it tends to be associated more with women because they associate, you know, their vitality and their youth with, you know, or their vitality and their beauty with their youth. And, you know, and they get subtle messages. Like if you are beyond a certain age, no guy's going to want you anymore or something like that. So, 
but it, it. Well, and of course, the hilarious thing, Sean, is my women friends, great number of them are widowed or right. divorced or whatever. Do they want to remarry? Do they want to team up? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Because mm. finally, you know, they're free and, and they're happy and they're independent. And, and it all goes back to health. If you're healthy, right. then you have these choices and, and you're fine. I do have women friends who occasionally find the guy mm. or the gal later on in their lives. But um, yeah, it just things, things evolve in a very interesting way. And, um, you know, the whole idea of, of what you look like. When I was in my 20s, I was not the girl because my fr I was in LA. And if you weren't tall and really skinny and blonde, nobody wanted to talk to you. I mean, you know, that just wasn't what was happening, right? And you look back on pictures of yourself and you go, whoa, yeah. that wasn't too bad. But, but it's, what, right. it's what happens internally, right? That it's right. what we think we look like or what we, how exactly. we think it's, we it's present It's the perceptions, ourselves. right? It's not the reality. So, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. Well, there, that, that, that's, a, that's a whole other thing right there. Um, but, all right. Well, Lynn, we are just past an hour here. Um, I could probably talk to you more, but I won't take up too much of your time. <laughs> I totally appreciate. Well, yeah, I, I I enjoy you coming on. I'm thankful. I'm I appreciate your insights. I'm sure anyone who's going to listen is going to appreciate them the same. And um, I I won't keep you from your gym time too. <laughs> I love your mission. I love your mission. Thank I you. love what you're doing. And uh, yeah, I am off to do my workout. In All a right. Few so, okay, yeah. well, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you. Miss Lynn Bowman, the snarky grandma, the all around awesome human being. Thank you so much for listening. This is the Fitness Reborn podcast. Hope you stay tuned for the next episode. Take care and be well.